Benjamin and Luke, for those that haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. I'm Luke Slindy. I'm a pharmacist who's very interested in pricing, how pharmacists and pharmacies are reimbursed for the services that they provide. And I'm also very interested in understanding the presence of any anti-competitive business practices that might exist in the pharmacy market. I'm Benjamin Jolly, pharmacist. I work for Jolly's Pharmacy, my dad's store. I work for CPSN now. I consult with pharmacies across the country, but I'm not speaking for any of the people I work for, just myself. And I write a blog about pharmacy and monopolies and pricing and all of the fun stuff. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the recent investigation by the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, into the business practices of the largest pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, that was recently announced. The last time we talked, Benjamin had his moment in the sun talking to the FTC 52 seconds, I think it was. But at the time, we were kind of waiting for a vote to come through to see if the FTC was going to look at the PBMs. And then it's like, no, that didn't happen. And then someone told me, well, it's not quite over. They might do this or that. And then before I know it, like two weeks ago, the FTC comes out to say that they've decided to do the inquiry into the PBM. Did they do a 180 or was this like a loophole that they could do, even though they voted it down, they could still do it? How did it go from not doing it to all of a sudden doing it? So what happened here is internal politics at the Federal Trade Commission and external politics to the Federal Trade Commission. So um, the original study that was proposed, I think this was three, four months ago, um, was a 2-2 vote divided on party lines. The two Democrats voted for, the two Republicans voted against. The Republicans, though, did say, this is a no, but I'd vote for it if it was a more detailed study. Apparently, from from news reports, supposedly the um, the original study was not terribly well detailed, well thought out, according to those parties. And apparently the last draft it was was circulated like 20 minutes before the meeting. And so... You mean the, the first yeah. one, the previous yeah. one. Yeah. And so anyway, so the two Republicans voted no, the two Democrats voted yes. They were split. So that means no action. Um, in the interim, the FTC staff worked diligently on... Um, developing a more comprehensive study, more well written out, more thought out. Um, and then also the Senate confirmed the fifth member of the Federal Trade Commission, Alvaro Bedoya. They usually only had four, but they decided to have five for this, or one was missing at the time? That one was missing, yeah. So the, the prior commissioner, Rohit Chopra, took a job um, with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, like in October. And so he could no longer be on the Federal Trade Commission. So um, anyway, so there was just a 2-2. It's normally a five-member commission. It's it's now a five-member commission again, and they voted 5-0 for the revised study, um, which is that, – that surprised me. I expected a 3-2. I did not expect a 5-0, to be frank. Did you expect the – vote to come again that soon? It seems like in politics, it's like, well, once a year we'll do something, but this came like three months later. Did you expect that? Honestly, not really, but um, apparently Lena Khan likes pharmacies, or at least is really interested in the subject of medications. Um, it is, I mean, my, my point that I made to the FTC is that this is like, when you look at the, at the Fortune 500, and this was Luke's idea originally, so when you look at the Fortune 500, the biggest companies that in, that control the most money are all in pharmacy, right? And so, and most of them are PBMs or wholesalers. And so it's a very natural place for the Federal Trade Commission to look at 
Um, they've got, you know, an enormously overwhelming job, but, um, if you're going to start somewhere, it makes sense to start with pharmacy. I was amazed at the depth of this thing. I think it was like 17 pages. They wanted like every time you breathed, we want to know about it kind of thing to all these PBMs. And I was just like, Mr. Evil, I was just wringing my hands in delight, you know, because it's like, that's the kind of baloney that they give to us for audits. But I saw that thing and I'm like, thank goodness someone else is doing that because I would never know how to get into those details and ask the right questions, which as you said, it helped to pass this thing. But then I realized that the FTC has like 300 attorneys or something like that. I'm like, well, you got to give them something to do. And I would just add that, you know, this, this uh, situation is what the FTC has been meant to be for, for all the way back to the very beginning. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission was created in 1914 when the c concerns about all of the detrimental effects of monopolies was at, had reached a peak. I mean, it, it started all the way throughout the Gilded Age and the trusts, you had the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, and basically the problem persisted and continued to get worse for the next 24 years after that. And finally, uh, you know, the government, how to react to the problem of monopolies uh, has been said by some historians to actually have been the most significant issue of the 1912 presidential election. So this is something that was at, you know, the absolute forefront of political discussions during that time period. And it was because of all of the power that rested in the hands of very small number of companies and all of the market distorting anti-competitive business practices that those firms held. So, you know, these are firms like Standard Oil and U.S. Steel and things like that. This is back in a point in time when we had very much a industrial manufacturing economy. So at that point in time, the most important businesses in the country were the people that produced steel or oil or aluminum or railroads, right? And fast forward to today where we our economy is oriented around different things. We prioritize you know, things at the forefront of our economy are things like software, um, internet connectivity, and because we've moved to a service economy and we're to a point now where you know, almost 20% of our GDP is in healthcare. That's, you know, healthcare is, is one of the biggest industries in our overall economy now. So uh, the same types of monopolization practices that occurred over 100 years ago in the most important industries of that day have now occurred in the most important industries of our day. And so it's almost a little bit like history is repeating itself and uh, this situation is exactly what the FTC was created to do. I'll have our listeners refer back to, I don't know, six months ago, we had a great discussion. I learned a ton in the podcast entitled Amazon and PBMs and other huge businesses or something like that. Um, so I'll have our listeners go back to that for kind of some of the, the real basis of the monopolies and so on. I'm not smart enough to look at this thing and do anything. I could maybe say, oh, I wish they would have used a little bit uh, prettier shade of paper or something like that. But when you guys looked at that 17 pages, did do you guys have the audacity to say, well, they missed this or I would have done that? When you looked through it, were you comfortable with what you saw? Would you have done something else? Um, I don't have the audacity to say that. It, it, when I looked over it, it, it answered pretty much every concern that I've got about the pharmacy benefit management market. It had, I want to know about network contracts and differential rates. It had steering. It had audit practices. It had uh, rebate information. Like all, all of these things that, um, you know, little independent pharmacists just complain about all the time. Um, it hit. It hit on like every single one of those points. And so I was, I was very pleased by what I saw 
Um, I will say that on a slightly different tack, the FTC more recently um, also issued a policy statement in reference to rebates um, that revived an act that has been dead letter law for 40 years, the Robinson-Patman Act. Um, And specifically... It's ban on commercial bribery, um, which is something that we haven't heard since before Reagan, which is just, I, I don't know, that just made me happy to see that, like, because as long as I've been, you know, politically active and trying to convince people, it's all, my my, my view of rebates has been, well, we can't really touch them until health and human services decides that they're illegal because they they have a safe harbor and they say it's fine if you stay inside these this box it's not it's not a kickback under the anti kickback statute but the federal trade commission said well i mean it 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 doesn't just have to be legit on the anti kickback statute front it also has to be legit according to the federal trade commission act and according to uh, the Robinson Patman Act, which um, w- which it bans commercial bribery, which basically means you pay someone off to not um, to preference your product over a competitor's, for example, which is exactly what PBM rebates are. They are kick they are kickbacks from pharma to exclude a competitor. Um, and so, seeing that policy statement, I don't know it. It was a breath of fresh air and makes me really excited that, I don't know, we're, I I think the next five years are going to be the most interesting times that the industry has had in at least two decades. (laughs) Here's my thought on some of these investigations. Michigan came up with rules for PBMs and it's going to go into effect on January 2024 and one of my team members was kind of excited and i said "Eh, don't get so excited i said they're gonna find some other way to screw us but i said that the value of these rules is it's one step closer to removing the opaqueness which makes it easier to explain to the michigan legislature which then maybe the next year they'll do more rules because they understand it better and there's not so much shenanigans going on. I mean, they're still going on, but they're easier to understand. I said it's going to be like peeling back an onion, you know, like three or four layers. Okay, that's Michigan. Cut to the chase. What happens with this thing now? So the PBMs respond to this. I'm too much of a negative thinker to think it's going to just solve it. I'm thinking there's layers like this, which will gradually improve things, but not right away. I would say that the most likely first layer would be that certain business practices, which are now the norm in the industry, may be ruled to be illegal. In which case, those particular business practices would have to stop and if you know they continued then there could be lawsuits surrounding them which then in theory would lead to enforcement further enforcement of those particular business practices being made illegal Um, and we've already identified and discussed some of those business practices like spread pricing or patient steering to pbm owned pharmacies Uh, you know there's a there's a long list of certain business practices which are problematic and each individual one could be ruled illegal. When you say they're illegal, are they already illegal under a larger umbrella and now they're just defining them and they're saying, guys, this is illegal because look it, it's a it's this. Of course it's illegal. It's under this umbrella which is already illegal. Are they kind of defining it? Or are they like making up new laws? I don't mean making them up like magical, but are they are they making them up with new legislation or are they just defining something and saying that's illegal and it should have always been illegal? You were just trying to get around it. I would definitely say that the scope of the FTC is the latter. So the, you know, the, the FTC is not going to be creating new legislation. 
it would be enforcing legislation that has been on the books for a long time, you know, uh, decades, if not a hundred years. And for whatever reason, there was selective non-enforcement of those laws. It's not even defining the loophole. It's like saying, we're going to finally enforce this. It's always been there. Correct. Yeah, correct. And so, uh, on, you know, as we are, <laughs> not to get into that, but as we are learning lately, um, there's a lot of room for interpretation that occurs in the justice system. And that has a really strong effect on what ends up happening. So first of all, you know, you can have legislation around something, the justice system is still able to interpret it. And then there's even another layer on top of that in that once it's been interpreted, there actually has to be some actual enforcement or what I like to call teeth. There has to be a penalty for not following the law. So you kind of need to have at least those three things in place. You need to have the, the, the legislation itself, the judicial interpretation of the legislation, and then enforcement through some form of penalty. And I think the, the onion metaphor is an apt one. Um, to me, there's lots of layers of the onion. Uh, the deepest layer of the onion or the core of it would be structural breakups. There is a historical precedent for this. Uh, Standard Oil was forced by the federal government to break into lots of smaller companies. AT&T was forced to break into smaller companies. Uh, Microsoft was not forced to break into smaller companies, but just the threat in the 90s that it may be structurally broken up uh, basically prevented Microsoft, they got scared and they didn't do a lot of tactics that they otherwise could have. And that actually allowed for lots of other companies to come in like Google, where, you know, if the FTC had not threatened uh, punishment and, and structural breakup of Microsoft in the 1990s, it's possible we would not have Google today. And so we, I mean, I'm always a big proponent of dreaming big. So the end game of this or the biggest, the way to dream the biggest would be structured breakups where um, basically we would dissolve some of the vertical integration that's occurred where the PBMs would have to be sold off from their holding companies such that the PBM and the health insurer would not be the same company. And then we also might to see horizontal breakups as well, where the FTC could determine that you know, it's not a good idea to have three companies control 80% of the PBM market, even if they're not connected to health insurers. So we are going to force some of those companies to break up into smaller companies as well. So to me, that would be the deepest layer of the onion. And there is historical precedent for this. I think it all has to go together because you could break things up and without the proper rules in place, these guys can all be playing games with each other and rebates and all that kind of stuff. So they have to be broken along with stricter boundaries, I imagine. Lena Khan did a, I guess, listening session with Michelle Belcher, the president of NCPA, a guy from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, the, the CMO there, a patient advocate, and talked about what the FTC is doing around PBMs. Um, just, I think this was just last week. Um, and in her Chair Khan of the Federal Trade Commission gave her concluding remarks and said that um, this this process will take time. Um, the original order gave the PBMs 90 days to respond. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to cough up all the documents in 90 days. It means that they're going to say, hi, um, I'm disputing that I can that I have to give you all this information. Right. So it, it may take a year, two years for this study to actually play out and get final results. But crucially in her, in her remarks, she said that where we find um, evidence of anti-competitive trade practices um, and suppression of competition and, you know, basically violations of the law, we will not wait till the study is published to take enforcement action. So as this study is ongoing, they will use the information that they learn 
to inform referrals to um, the Department of Justice for um, lawsuits, um, which could include criminal lawsuits. This The Sherman Act, um, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act is a criminal statute. It's not just a civil statute. Attempts to monopolize the market are felonies. And that's perfect because in my mind, you've got a guy making, you know, pfft, whatever they're making, you know, and they're worth, you know, a few billion dollars someone is or whatever. And you take away a billion, you know, <laughs> you still got a two billionaire. So you got to hit them where it hurts. And that's probably sitting in the slammer for a while. Absolutely. To Luke's point, though, I think that, I think the core of this. So I think that we'll see as time goes on, we'll see. Assuming that there's not some coup d'etat or something like that, um, I think we'll see that the Federal Trade Commission will find anti-competitive practices and issue enforcement um, policies saying, hey, uh, th this is what we view as out of bounds. And you, CBS Caremark, you, OptumRx, you, Express Scripts are out of these bounds. Um we view this as commercial bribery or whatever whatever statute they want to find it under, and they will sue them in court, get an injunction against that behavior, potentially fine them, and then probably over the course of time, maybe a breakup. Who knows? Um, company Breakups of companies, Luke mentioned there is historical precedent for it, but it takes forever. Um, <laughs> the... The breakup of AT&T that Luke mentioned took 15 years. And we're at the very beginning of those 15 years if it follows a similar course. Breakups during the FDR years were a lot quicker because um, the, the approach was very different. Um, FDR's... Um, uh, Department of Justice antitrust head was Thurmond Marshall, who um, Thurgood Marshall, excuse me, um, who would issue companies criminal and civil um, uh, lawsuits at the same time, saying, "Hey, we're we are um, prosecuting you for violation of of this criminal statute, and we are also suing you for the civil statute." And um, when he issued that notice. He, he would basically just walk up to a company and they would say, okay, hand, hand me a, a settlement and I'll sign it because I don't want to go to jail. Um, and he, he, also, he also had a lot more um, public backing for what he was doing because a lot of the companies he was going after were literally selling to Nazis um, and were – basically betraying the U.S. government in its in its war against um, against Nazi Germany. And so he had a lot of ammunition to take people to jail if they didn't play ball. Who's threatened for jail at, on these things? Is it the CEO or is it down from there? I know like Madoff and stuff going to jail, but I don't really recall and I ain't that schooled, you know, but I don't really recall like CEOs going to jail for something their company did. Is that, does that happen? Not recently, <laughs> not in the last 40 years. That's why I don't remember it then. Right. But it, it is, it is in statute that, um, the principles of a company can go to jail for what the company does. Um, and similarly, um, th there are all sorts of acts that impose a ton of liability on, on corporate officers that, haven't really been enforced. Um, ERISA, which was the PBM's favorite act to say your PBM law is, is illegal, imposes a fiduciary duty on, on the generally the chief financial officer to make sure that a health plan, it, its assets are properly managed. And my, um, my status quo in my head is that if you've hired one of the big three PBMs, your health plan isn't properly managed. And so you per you are personally liable for losses to the health plan due to your mismanagement. But again, that hasn't really been enforced. Um, some employees of T-Mobile sued their CFO 
for mismanaging their health plan uh, like two years ago, and they won, um, which is kind of fascinating. But that's the first case that I've heard of of that sort. That wasn't jail time. No, it wasn't jail time. It was just it was just a fine, but it was personal assets of the chief financial officer. Oh, is that right? Personal assets. Yes. No kidding. The CFO was the fiduciary of the plan. So so when they signed up, they were the one that when they signed the documents to say I am in charge of the of the health plan, that made them personally liable. Why would they take on that responsibility? Is it just part of their contract? It's just expected that they'll take the fall. Is there any benefit to them except for the CEO not doing it and someone has to do it? Someone has to be the fiduciary of a health plan in every case. It has to be someone, and it makes sense that it's the guy who's responsible for the finances of the company, right? Um, but it's not always. It, it just de- it depends on the company. It can be as varied as the number of companies in the country. There are things that our law doesn't enforce or has not enforced for the last my whole lifetime um, that the Biden administration's appointees – have decided our law that matters, which people hate Joe Biden. His approval ratings are terrible. But if he did one thing right, it was a point, well, three things right. It was appointing Lena Khan, Alvar Bedoya, and um, Jonathan Conter as his antitrust people um, because they have taken that job and they are already having an impact. I'm familiar with Lena Khan. Where do the other two come in? Are they in a different commission? Um, so Bedoya is the other member of the Federal Trade Commission. He's under Khan? Yes. Yeah. So so, so it's he's one of the Democratic appointees. Khan is the chair. There's, there's usually two Democrats and two Republican appointees and then a chairperson. That's the five we talked about earlier. Right. And um, they, they serve for seven-year terms. So... Lena Khan has just crossed her one year mark as head of the Federal Trade Commission. So she's one of the five. She's one of the five. So she'll be there for another six years. The other members of the Federal Trade Commission I didn't mention. Then who's the third that you mentioned? The, the third person I mentioned was Jonathan Conter. He's the assistant attorney general for antitrust at the Department of Justice. How many different divisions that are there only two the Department of Justice and the FTC or is there another branch that sort of gets into this fight too those two are the main ones but but you know we have all sorts of other similar kinds of entities in the government that that are all, all come from the same era um, so the Securities and Exchange Commission the comptroller of the currency I mean there's there's all these crazy little entities in the government that no one pays any attention to, but that can have enormous impact on federal policy. But the, but the two main ones for antitrust are, are the Department of Justice Antitrust Division and, and the Federal Trade Commission. Those are the two that primarily have, uh, have their job as, as dealing with monopolies. It's probably an oversimplification, but the Federal Trade Commission is kind of like the the researchers and the gather the data, make the case, and then the antitrust division of the Department of Justice is the actual legal hammers. Like they're they're the ones that the lawsuits are brought by the FTC and then they go through the judicial system, ultimately arriving at the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, and then those are where the final legal decisions are made. I reference back to the last podcast we had, and you guys did such a great job of saying that it's important that we get out of our own little groups and that the pharmacists get out of that and the booksellers and the shoemakers and all these things they get out and they join forces to say that these monopolies are not good for the whole country, not our little segments. That's what we talked about. And then now, a couple months later, it is pharmacy. I know health care is a $4 trillion industry and so on. Did pharmacy somehow rise to the top because it was so bad? Or how about these other industries that we said it would be good for all these industries to conglomerate to go up to the FTC? But pharmacy did rise to the top. Because people die. 
Mm. Everyone goes to a pharmacy. That That's the biggest thing. They maybe don't care about the pharmacists as much, but everybody goes to a pharmacy. Like 90% of Americans take a, medica- a prescription medication at least once over the course of like a two-year period. So... So the influence that pharmacy and pharmacy benefit managers has touches every person in the country. Um, even if even if you know you're a healthy young lad that doesn't have any problems at all, and you just get a you know you just go to get your COVID shot, like you've interacted with a PBM and a pharmacy almost certainly in the process of getting your COVID shot or your flu shot, or you get a strep throat and you go get an amoxicillin, you've interacted with that system. And so it, it touches so many people. Um, the, the Federal Trade Commission isn't just doing pharmacy. They're doing all of the things. There's other industries that are maybe getting the same 17-page documents that the PBMs are getting. Yes. I mean, just as a for example of an action that happened that's still in healthcare but not in pharmacy um, – Davida Dialysis he, uh, tried to buy um, the University of Utah's dialysis clinics here in Utah. And the Federal Trade Commission said, uh, not so fast. Um, that's an illegal merger. You're, you're going to monopolize the Utah market for dialysis. And the two companies just backed down. They just said, OK, fine. Um, and the the FTC, I think, has issued um, w- when – when they've had these mergers like this come in front of them, because under antitrust law, if you're making a purchase of more than I think eighty million dollars of one company of another, you have to you have to tell the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission so that they can think about it before you actually buy them, and then they have like thirty days to respond and say, "Hey, no, you can't merge um, yet. We want more information." A so-called second request. Anyway. W- in the last year, when they've when they've made these second requests, every time the companies have just said, "Yeah, nope, never mind. Uh, we're not going to try." Um, and so it, it's been pretty incredible to just watch the watch the government actually stick up for itself and say say, "Hey, no, you can't." And they didn't even have to litigate it in court. There's been a deterrent because they've seen that they've toughened up. Yeah, the, the companies knew what they were doing was illegal. They just hoped to slip it past the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, and they didn't slip past. And they're like, "Okay, fine, we'll we'll not do it." It's it's a total total shift in in policy. Like I think the the whole ship has been turned around and is going back in a different another direction, which at the federal government level is a small miracle. It's got to be kind of fun for you guys, because this was like your hobby, you know, thinking about the FTC. And then this gal came in and here it is changing. And yeah, it's it's been a very interesting time for people that are interested in this stuff, I would say. There's investigations that are ongoing and pharmacy is one such investigation that they're doing. But there's also all kinds of other changes that are going on. And it was mentioned, um, you know. They're rewriting wholesale their merger guidelines. So the FTC is is currently in the process of completely revamping the way that they review and either approve or deny all mergers, all, you know, every industry above a certain size threshold that uh, Benjamin referenced. And so just the effect of that uh, going forward is going to be immense. Now, some industries, unfortunately, are already monopolized to the point where just affecting the future merger guidelines isn't necessarily going to be enough. So that is the point at which they're going to need to do these investigations and then basically go back and, you know, you can think of a structural breakup as more or less like a retroactive denial of a merger, because these companies got to be the size that they were and attain the market power that they have most of the time because of mer- mergers and acquisitions that happened in the past. And so, you know, pharmacy is no different. You look at all of the large PBMs that are coming under scrutiny, all of them went through several mergers and acquisitions to get to the point where they're at now. So, um, 
you know, it's it's important to kind of understand that you know the the merger process and the and the guidelines for approval or denying a merger going forward is going to change but they're also now going to retroactively look at some of the mergers that were approved in the past and ultimately decide you know was that a good idea and if not that is where the structural breakups come from when i think about laws and where the PBMs have been able to go, not so much through mergers, but just through their practices, it always seems to come back to money. And it always seems the conversation always seems to come back to lobbyists, you know, that the lobbyists have so much money that they do their thing to the legislators. And then lo and behold, nothing changes. In your guys' opinion, is that true for this whole FTC thing in the past? But the legislatures don't really get involved so much. So it was some lobbying of the Trade Commission and so on. What's what's the term you use, Benjamin? The shield of boring? Yes. Yes. The shield of boringness. Um, there's – it's actually, I think, a term from uh, a great a great little comic for kids, but sort of like Calvin and Hobbes. In this in this comic series, there's this little girl who has a friend who is a unicorn. But um, instead of like in Calvin and Hobbes, Hobbes is a stuffed tiger, not a real tiger. Um, but Calvin imagines him to be a real tiger. In this, it's a real unicorn, but she has a shield of boringness that she can turn up so that her so that the parents don't recognize that she's a unicorn. Um, in the context of um, of government policy, like when we talk about banking policy and PBM policy and stuff, this stuff is so boring, right? Like we're talking about Mac prices and like, I, I remember going to legislative day when I was in pharmacy school in Missouri, in Jefferson city. And it was sponsored by the Missouri pharmacy association. And they got all of the students in my year to go. So there were, there were 150 pharmacy students on on Capitol Hill, and they had put us all in a room with all these pharmacists from the Missouri Pharmacy Association. And this this old pharmacist gets up there and starts talking about Mac pricing, and he he pulls up all these spreadsheets and how they've got multiple prices on the same day. But man, I was bored, and this is like my thing. All all of the rest of the students they were like asleep. Um, even though the guy's describing like these ridiculously terrible um, business practices, it's just so boring to your average Joe that, you know, when the guy starts going into detail, your eyes just glaze over. You know, a lot of terrible things are able to be brought, you know, into existence because they're boring. You know, you can get away with a lot of these financial crimes uh, because, you know, first of all, as you've alluded to earlier, it's very difficult to understand. So if you can't even understand it, it's really hard to, you know, to get angry about something that you can't understand. There's a, there's a word that I come back to a lot called, and it's one of my favorite words, it's pernicious, which is defined as having a harmful effect, especially in a gradual or subtle way. And I mean, that is, I think, the perfect word to kind of describe this multi-decade evolution that of PBMs that's basically a, a, you know, caused us to arrive at the point where we are now. It's been very subtle and little changes here and there, but those changes compound on themselves. And then uh, so you end up having this very pernicious effect that arrives us to where we are now. I think I think we got to go back like 50 years here. Um to uh, a gentleman named Robert Bork and several other people in the Chicago School of Law um, who founded this movement that was called Law and Economics, which basically said that antitrust law and other similar kinds of laws should not be seen as protecting companies from each other, but protecting consumers from companies in part and also basically it challenged the concept that big companies are bad which is in statute attempts to monopolize are in the sherman act felonies um 
but the the brain worm, as Cory Doctorow puts it, um, that big companies can be more efficient and deliver lower prices and that the antitrust law is really about lower prices and about consumer uh, welfare, it, it just completely changes your mentality. And what happened is that Robert Bork and his allies wrote all of these articles and books, in particular, The Antitrust Paradox, which then um, they also hosted seminars for judges and for lawyers that explained their way of thinking. And over time, this caused the federal bench, all of the judges, pretty much all of the judges to be in that line of thinking that, you know, this is about efficiency, this is about lower prices, not about harms to competition per se. Um, and the same thing happened to the head of the Department of Justice at that time. So I talked about Jonathan Conter as being this phenomenal um, gentleman who has, you know, basically resurrected the concept that, you know, we should actually sue people. Um, one of my favorite stories about him is that he um, he got in front of a bunch of lawyers at, at the Department of Justice and, and said, how many of you have never lost a case? And a whole bunch of people raise their hand and they're all proud of themselves. I've never lost a case. And he's like, you all, and I'm quoting him here, are the chicken club. Because what, what he's saying is, that if you never lose a case, that means that you are choosing not to prosecute cases that you might lose. And so even if the government loses cases, that means that they are trying, right? They are actually choosing to enforce the law. If someone never loses a case, that means that they, um, that they're only choosing to prosecute the easy wins. Um, and so he's told all of his staff to listen to uh, – what's that rock song that he told them to listen to? Um, oh, I don't remember. Like, ne never going to – not never going to give you up, but like – Benjamin, you just rickrolled us. My brain got <laughs> rickrolled there because I can't remember the name of the darn song. Come on. I won't back down. That's the song. Tom Petty. Yes, Tom, Tom Petty. Tom Petty. I won't back down. He told them to listen to that on repeat until they're excited about just – fighting the big companies. Basically, the opposite happened in 1980. A new head at the Department of Justice Antitrust Commission came in and said, you know what? Nope, we're, we're just not going to enforce the law anymore. That's what happened. Who rubber stamps these? Imagine the, the head of the FTC doesn't look at every merger. So who's soft? When you look at the FTC, who's deciding whether these things are okay? This is why Lena Khan is such a controversial figure at the Federal Trade Commission, is that um, for the last 40 years, the Federal Trade Commission basically hasn't been doing their jobs. And her her coming in and basically saying that offended the entire staff um, who thought, we're doing good jobs, we're, we're taking care of consumers, we're doing all the right stuff. But she's like, look, you guys have been letting through all of these mergers. You've been doing a terrible job. And... That really ticks off the two Republican commissioners, Noah Phillips and Christine Wilson, who have – they were both staff at the FTC at one point for – and they've been in there for like 20 years. And so she's coming in and saying, you guys have been completely botching your job. And they're like, this is my whole career you're talking about here. It's also worth pointing out that a lot of the – I think what you could call the pro big business media that's out there, uh, namely the Wall Street Journal – but there are others have released quite a bit of articles that have been critical of this new administration. And that kind of stands to reason, right? I mean, if, if you're the, the art, you know, the, the journal of wall street and big, big business, uh, if all of a sudden you have federal trade commission, actual enforcement and, you know, uh, cops on the beat, if you will, they're not going to like that. And so there's already been several what I would characterize as like hit pieces uh, written about the new administration because, uh, you know, they don't like them. They view them as a, an annoying hindrance in their plot to get all the money in the world. I'm guessing every merger over a certain size of company, does that go up to that five member commission? 
it seems like they wouldn't see everything. There's got to be a ton of mergers that they wouldn't see all of them. I think it's called the Hart Scott Rodino Act. Um, HSR requires companies that are, I think it's over $80 million. It might be 84 or something um, that are merging to file a notice of intent to merge with the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice to allow those those ent- those uh, government entities to respond. Um, and last year, it sure felt like all of the companies were trying to just completely overwhelm the Federal Trade Commission staff so that they wouldn't be able to respond. When you say staff, do those five people actually vote on every merger over 80 some million? I don't know how the process honestly works. I'm trying to figure out who's dropping the ball, who's soft or who's getting bought out. So so the staff reviews every one of these HSRs and either lets it go or or sends a second request. And I think that my view of how this works is that probably it does go to the five member commission to say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. But I don't actually know. With maybe a lot of input and, you know, they might almost know their answer before it gets to them kind of thing. Plus, it's really important to understand that the difference between the pre-ideological shift versus now, right? So, you know, a lot of the things that were happening for, you know, 40 plus years from 1980 through last year, um, you know, the directives were coming from the very top. So it wasn't like there was like some rogue group of people at the FTC that were, you know, causing something. It was the whole, the whole agency ideologically was not really enforcing the laws because of the precedents that had started in the 1980s. And so now the ship has been turned around and that's why there's a lot of, you know, uh, consternation and disagreement internally and coming from the outside because everything has changed. Let's say that both of you guys are out of a job and you're not losing an opportunity cost and different levels of these FTC jobs open up and you're getting paid the same as they are. Would you take the top position or do you think there would either be too much pressure, getting too many attacks from, you know, the press that you wouldn't want it for your family or this or that? How far up would you go if someone offered you one of those jobs tomorrow? Well, I, I would I would be happy with being the chair. You would take it. Yeah. My uh, my wife always tells me that I'm like one of the most immune people to criticism in the whole world. So uh, <laughs> I don't if people wanted to hate me because of my positions and decisions at the FTC chair, I think I would be okay with that. I forgot this question, though, Luke. Would you feel confident to take that job? Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't have, um, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, and that person should be a lawyer. So that kind of instantly discredits me there. Why should they be? So they know the law or just so they have that stamp behind their name to have some power? I, th- I think this is a very complicated subject. And I, I like reading about it, but I mean, my my knowledge is pretty much reading, you know, 10 books about the subject and then thinking about how what I learned from those 10 books applies to the things that I see day in and day out in the pharmacy space. You know, the movie Dave, you know, where the guy looks like the president and he has to be the president and so on. Let's say you end up there. Could you fake it for a while? They got 300 lawyers that are working for you. I mean, it would be pretty easy to just deny every merger for a while and see what happens. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. All right. How about you, Benjamin? Uh, um, well, I wouldn't feel competent because like most of what we're talking about here is people management, right? If you're in charge of if, – if you're a member of the Federal Trade Commission or you're the head of, of the Department of Justice Antitrust Division – most of your job is not not per se the um the like making the decisions doing the work right it's the convincing your staff that this is how we're doing things and that is not my forte that is not that is not what i'm good at i i, I am not good at people management at all i'm happy to bloviate about subjects at length um but the Working through the minutiae of who who gets what job, 
that is not my that is not my thing that I'm good at. That's a pretty full plate that someone has. Like Khan, I mean, they got to have the smarts and they got to have the tactics and they've got to have the administration. I mean, that's a that'd be a full time job. It, it, it literally <laughs> is. I might have to work forty hours a week if I were in that job. <laughs> this is an agency that we. As a as a as a nation, need to expand their resources. You know, we need to give them more funding, hire more people. You know, all of that. Uh, it's you know, it's kind of analogous to the whole IRS concept, where I know nobody likes to pay their taxes, but if we have an underfunded, under resourced IRS, it makes it that much easier for people to cheat on their taxes. So. If we want to have a an agency that's that's performing well, it has to be you know well resourced from that perspective. Now, going to the evil side, if you guys were both heads of the PBMs, all right. Now, we want to make this true to life. So take all your morals away. <laughs> You can't bring any morals into the job, but you do want to avoid ending up in jail. I'm not saying you're going to do everything right, but you can't get caught. And one of your biggest goals is just improving your stock value. What are you going to do for the next, you know, five years as head of the PBMs. And let's say you guys are each ahead of your own PBM and you're one of the top three or whatever. How do you defend against this? Well, I can tell you what JC Scott, the head of PCMA is doing. Um, and that seems to be just lying through his teeth about what they are doing. Um, just saying, no, that's not what we do. We save people money. No, we, we don't. We don't do bribes. These are good for people. And just repeating the same talking points over and over and over and over again. All right. But now, Benjamin, you get this 17 page document. How are you going to play out the next five years to still end up on this evil mountaintop? The first thing that I would do is uh, try to get a court to throw out as many pieces of, of that order as possible. If I'm Express Scripts, I've been through more lawsuits then I have hairs on my head. And so I know which courts are friendly to me. I know which courts are not. So I'm going to go to whichever court is the most friendly to me and say, hey, I need you to say, no, they can't do this. No, they can't do that. Try and gum up the works as much as possible. Just like in two small businesses suing each other or family, they've got the discovery and half of them, the attorneys come back and say, you don't need this. This is overstepping and then things like that. So that's what you would do. You would cloud that up. As much as possible. That's, that's the first thing that I would do. It'd be very effective for them to continue to deflect as much as possible, right? So uh, point out, you know, hammer the point home over and over again that manufacturers are who raises the prices, right? So deflect as much of the negative energy as you can towards the manufacturers. Then when you run out of steam with that, then make sure that you place all the blame at the plan sponsors that hire you. Are you saying do that in the document or are you saying turn over what you cannot ignore and then in the court of public opinion do these things or maybe... Once you've already sent this in and you start taking the next step, I guess that those are two different strategies. So in terms of like turning over the documents as part of this official investigation, there's this term that's become really popular since like 10 years ago, and it's flood the zone with shit. <laughs> give too much. Yeah, give them uh, an unbelievable amount of information, mix in a ton of stuff that is false um, make it really, really complicated so that it's as hard to decipher as possible. Make it so that half of the information is true and half of it isn't. And just basically, you know, it, it's a lot, it's a lot more effective. And you know, unfortunately we've seen that it's really effective over, over the last 10 years in a lot of different arenas to, instead of hiding information or obscuring it, um, sometimes it's more effective to just basically just spew out as much 
information as you possibly can and make sure that enough of it is false that you plant the seed of doubt into everyone's heads. Nobody knows whether the information is correct or not. They are the experts in what they do. Uh, there's an informational asymmetry. So basically, think about the amount of effort that would have to go into disproving information that they provide. You'd have to round up every other counterparty. You'd have to go out and get all the pharmacies on board and all of the health plan sponsors and everybody else that interacts with them and cross-reference all of the information across all those different places and then make sure that that corroborates with what they gave you in their official submission. Just think about the sheer amount of effort that would have to be involved in all of that. And so, you know, that's why it's really easy for them to put out misinformation because in order to disprove it, the onus is on you to disprove it, but the amount of effort that has to go into that is enormous. I'm just thinking as Luke's talking here, if I'm a PBM, I just take all of the claims data that I have from the last five years, just every single line item, you know, we've, we're talking probably a terabit, multiple multiple petabits of of Excel spreadsheets and just don't send a data dictionary of what the column headers are. Delete delete one of the columns that's like the the index to be able to say, okay, this goes with this. Like delete the prescription number or the or, or something. So that now now you've just got like these two spreadsheets that are like a petabit each and the unique reference number that links this spreadsheet to this spreadsheet is gone. So, like, good luck. Have fun. This is actually kind of fun to think about how how annoying you could be if you really wanted to. If anyone at Express Scripts is listening, please don't do that. Please comply. When I was in college, I was in this house, and computers were relatively new. It was the late 80s, and someone had showed me how to save something to the disk. And so I told some of the guys I knew how to save it. Ended up, I saved it all, like, in the hieroglyphic font, and there was no way to reverse it. So that kind of thing, that kind of thing. All right, so you hand all this crap over, and they can't disprove it, really. Well, put, putting on my optimist hat again here. There's enough crap going on that I, I I cannot imagine that like taking even a cursory glance at all of the contracts with any fraction of knowledge of what's happening, it becomes immediately apparent that this is that this is BS. I take back what I said about disproving it because I know it'd be hard to go to like individuals and individual pharmacies, but you could probably get stuff from insurance companies and the manufacturers that they could do a similar thing. And pretty soon you could pretty quickly, you could line up that it's baloney. Just a standard template PBM contract probably contains at least five violations of law, in my opinion. Just the contracts. J just, just the like 20 page template contract. Just that alone. If if you look at it with understanding of the in industry, I'm fairly certain that offering to reimburse a pharmacy at WAC minus 13 has to be illegal under some statute somewhere, um, especially if they get a copy of my contract and they get a copy of the contract that's offered to Walgreens, and mine says WAC minus 13 and theirs says WAC minus 4. Um, th th that has to be illegal somehow. I wrote a blog post about this last night. I read that. The structure of brand name drugs is that far, it, it, pharmacies buy drugs on average at WAC minus four, but really wholesalers buy it at WAC minus two and a half, and and PBMs buy it from pharmacies at WAC minus thirteen in some cases. This is not the way that supply chains work. Things don't get cheaper as you go from one end of the supply chain to the other, right? Um. But that's the way that the pharmacy brand main mar market works is everything gets cheaper the farther you go down the supply chain until you get to the last step and then it goes way through the ceiling, I'm pretty sure. We maybe skew the database and then you're the CEO still, you turn it into them. And then do you just sort of wait or do you pack your bags for uh, Tahiti or what do you do to you? putting the best spin you can on things until you're either fired or you're put in jail or you retire happy. I mean, isn't that just 
every corporate executive's mindset all the time? You're right. The CEOs that have risen to the top, that's how they live. This FTC thing is they've got a hundred of these things going on, different lawsuits and crap like that. That's how they live. I, I think that for this, there's an attitude that is in government and in big corporations um, that's referred to as IBG, YBG. I'll be gone. You'll be gone. <laughs> yeah. That you do, you do whatever you're going to do. But by the time the crap hits the fan and the government comes to get you, you're, you've already retired. You're gone or else the person following you retires and someone new comes in and kind of forgets about you. Most of the mergers that we're talking about happened, say, if we take CVS as an example, happened under the auspices of Larry Merlo. He's no longer there. It's Karen Lynch now, right? By the time the, the crap's hitting the fan, it's someone else who's in charge who was not responsible for the decision to merge with Caremark, was not responsible for the, the, for the decision to merge Advance and PCS and Advance PCS with Caremark. Is there anything else you would try to do as a CEO? Well, I think you would want to continue to make it as hard as possible for the general public to get access to real pricing information. I would also reach out to every pharmaceutical manufacturer and continue to encourage them to only develop drugs for basically orphan diseases. And um, because that, that business model has worked out tremendously well for everyone involved. Uh, effectively, we as a society have said that no, there is no expense that we won't pay um, if someone has a certain medical condition and there is a drug that at least shows that there is some benefit for that medical condition that you can charge literally any price and it will get paid in one capacity or, or another. And it, there, the, the fewer patients there are that have a condition, it's an easy justification to just raise the price. And I would disincentivize and try to get pharmaceutical manufacturers from never again making something like the next Lipitor. Reverse that hat now. What might you do to try to neutralize some of these evil CEOs? Voting is important. Uh, I think one really positive change is that the FTC has now made it a lot easier to provide comments. Uh, that's That's something that we didn't particularly address earlier is that, you know, why was there such a change in, you know, from the previous vote that was two to two and now it's five to zero? Yeah, it's like 24,000 comments, right? And there's only 20,000 independent pharmacies. Exactly. So, you know, the, the FTC has created avenues for people to make their voice heard on very specific issues, and it doesn't have to go through the mediation layer of your local, uh, you know, congressperson. You can, you can directly make your feelings known to the FTC and they're giving people avenues to do that. So I strongly encourage people to do that. And uh, to the pharmacy owners out there, I would suggest uh, sharing as much information as possible with other pharmacy owners. Uh, I really can't stress that enough. Um, the, there are these very large organ, multi-billion dollar organizations and they are doing their thing. And I think that if we're going to get traction and understand like how to influence political power, it's, it's, it's critical that pharmacy owners share as much information about their operations with other pharmacies as possible. Because I would say that there is a ton of bad things that happen to pharmacies that are done by multi-billion dollar organizations. And it occurs because this pharmacy owner is not aware of what's happening to the pharmacy owner in the town, in the next town over, or the next state over, or what have you. Um, there is incredible amount of harm that comes to pharmacies, sm small pharmacies, because they are not aware of what is happening to their counterparts. So I would really, really strongly encourage pharmacies to share as much information with each other as possible, including contracts, um, 
pricing, acquisition costs, all that kind of thing. Uh, I know that that might seem a little revolutionary, but I, I think that it is in the interests of pharmacy owners to basically be as communicative and sh informational sharing with each other as possible. And that is a way that you can start to uh, fight against some of these anti-competitive anti business practices that are done by large companies that are intentionally designed to splinter all of the smaller pharmacy groups apart from each other and keep them in the dark. Once in a while you hear about these guys and these guys have got to be idiots that they're these business guys and you find out they have like a wife in like four different cities. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I love my wife, but I only want one of them. Are you saying that these pharmacies share this because they're all kind of getting screwed, but they don't really maybe see all the ways they're getting screwed and they kind of say, hey, you, did you look at this? Do you understand how this is hurting you? Is that what you're saying? Kind of commiserate and really understand how terrible this is for you? Well, I think to follow your metaphor, if I was one of the four wives and I didn't know about the existence of the other three wives and what was happening to them with, with our shared spouse... I think you would be greatly benefited by communicating with the other wives and sharing as much information with each other as possible. But doesn't every pharmacy already know that they're getting screwed? No, they don't because it's something in the contract. They don't realize it. Or maybe they don't realize how bad the DIR is because they don't put two and two together kind of thing. In my experience in talking to other pharmacy owners, the amount of crap that goes on that people don't realize, just as a for example, here in Utah, um, our state law prohibits PBMs in audits from auditing more than 100 claims. PBMs interpret that as prescription numbers, but that is not what the law says. And so they will issue an audit that is not in compliance with the law. If the pharmacy knows their rights and pushes back, then the PBM will back down. But if you don't know, then you don't know and you get audited on this much larger audit. And the number of pharmacy owners that I've talked to and pharmacy managers that just don't know that that law exists and that they have such rights is is a surprising number. Like I, I talked to a pharmacy owner just 20 miles south of here who got an audit of 300 prescriptions from a, from a major PBM and um, and I told him, hey, just send them back. Utah State code this. Um, you can't do this. And they'll have to cut it back. And so he did and they did. But he had no idea. I didn't know this four years ago. And that's just one very small example. But um, there's, there's so much stuff that happens. I mean – the number of price lists that the big companies and not just the PBMs, but also our wholesalers have like the big wholesalers have as many price lists as they have pharmacies, it feels like. And the big PBMs have as many price lists as there are people in the United States. Right. And so if there's if there's one price for every person, then there's not a price. A couple weeks ago, the FTC came out with this letter. Two days later, I gave a talk to a Rotary Club and I said, by chance, I'm up in front of you people here and this is the best news I've seen in pharmacy in 25 years. True? Yes. Yeah. I would agree in terms of uh, directionality. We're, we're, we're at an inflection point. I think, I think you could make the case. And to be honest with you, it, you know, this is personal for me because – you know, it, uh, I graduated in 2008 and I've been a pharmacist ever since then. And I hate to say it, but I feel like our profession has just steadily gotten worse every year, year over year since that time. And, uh, and my father, I was a pharmacist for 42 years. And that means that for probably at least the last 22 years of his career, everything was getting progressively worse. Uh, and then he retired. So, you know, psychologically, that's pretty difficult, right? Uh, but, but to your point, uh, in terms of the best news, I would agree because I think we are at finally an inflection point where things could, there, there at least is a way now that this, we can stop the bleeding 
and start to move in a different direction. I'm thinking of this in terms of like a double derivative. The, the, the acceleration has changed. We've, we've made the change in acceleration from constantly going worse and worse and worse faster to things are starting to slow down how quickly they're getting worse and maybe starting to move back the other direction. That doesn't mean that things are getting better right now. I think things are still continuing to get worse, and I think they will for the next couple of years. Margins at pharmacies will go down. Staff, staffing conditions at big chain pharmacies will continue to get worse for a couple more years. They're not getting as bad as quickly. Th that's what I'm thinking is I, I think that it's I, I think that we're about to turn the corner here where things start to get better. But it's hard to keep that optimism. But the seeds of that are being planted right now. Well, guys, golly, Benjamin, on SNL, they've got like a five timer jacket and you're at four now. So next time you're on here, I've got to get you like a five timer. You're in the lead. The reason you're in the lead is because you bring good information. So thank you. You're welcome. I, I expect a uh, five years of service or something pin. <laughs> you got something it. Something like that. Something of high value. Yes. <laughs> I want a little a little pin that says the Business of Pharmacy podcast five timer. I'm going to put it on my white coat and wear it w next to my five gallons of blood or whatever it is. Luke, you're at two now, but uh, you'll get there. I mean, to your comments earlier, you know, this is going to be an ongoing thing for quite some time. So, I mean, I think it makes sense probably to at least have an annual check in to be like, all right, where are the pharmacy antitrust issues at now? Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Until next time. Thank Thanks. you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.